The Historical Society of the United States Courts in Nebraska is pleased to present another in its video histories. Today we're discussing his life with the Honorable William Cambridge, a retired United States District Judge for the District of Nebraska. Judge Cambridge, it's great to have you out. Well, thank you. Good to see you it's, again. It's a sir. delight, my friend. We're all fraternity. We brothers. are fraternity brothers. We're double fraternity brothers, Phi Delta Phi and Phi Psi. That's right. Uh, great days uh, in our experience. We'll get to that, uh, mm -hmm. your experience in college uh, uh. in a few moments. Uh, let me ask you about your life. You were born in, in uh, Iowa. That's correct. Uh, how did an Iowegian get over to this side of the river? Well, in, I think it was uh, 1943. I would have been 11 years old at that time. The family moved over here mm -hmm. and uh, settled here. And, and uh, my, two, my two daughters... Uh, used to say back in, when they were in their high school days that Dad came from Iowa over here to Nebraska in a covered wagon. <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, uh, was your family, we, uh, was your dad in business or no, a uh, farmer or what? Dad uh, was with General Foods uh, as a salesman mm -hmm. during the Depression. But... Uh, uh, he wound up losing that job for some reason. As many, many dads did. Yeah. And uh, so he was working over here, and, and, uh, and again, I don't know exactly what. I was too young to, to really pay much attention to that. But uh, mother thought we better all get together and get over here to... Mm -hmm to uh, Omaha in order to maintain the home. So, so you finished uh, h uh, high school in the Omaha schools. I did. Uh, I was uh, entering, uh, when we moved here, I went to Lothrop grade school out north for the seventh and eighth grades. And over in Atlantic, that was a, a bit of a come down over in Atlantic. <laughs> You would have gone to junior high and been in the seventh and eighth grade. Sure. But, uh, we moved over here in seventh and eighth grades. We're part of the elementary grade school, mm -hmm. so I went back to grade school. <laughs> back. And uh, then I went to North for two years, and then we moved over. Uh, we lived out on Locust Street when we first came here. I remember the address well, 2012 Locust, and uh, then we moved in about 40 or 7 or 48, 1947 or 48, we moved over to 35th and Poppleton, mm -hmm. and when we did that, I, I, trans I transferred from north to central. Mm -hmm. So I did my last two years of high school at Central High. Were you involved in any activities in high school? Uh, no, not... Uh, not really. Mm -hmm. uh, you well, know, they had some minor clubs that uh, no no sports activities and. Uh, well, you know, uh, the great jurist in you, uh, one might think you'd been a high school debater, and that didn't want yeah, you no, to go I, on to law ultimately. No, I I, I didn't. Should have, but didn't. <laughs> not, not necessarily. Uh, <laughs> uh, you went. Uh, you started out at the University of Omaha, didn't you? I did. I uh, I went to the uh, University of Omaha after graduation from Central. Now that not was still from, a municipal university. It was at that time. Mm -hmm. That would have been in uh, forty-nine to fifty, and then uh, received a. An ROTC scholarship, and uh, that enabled me to go down to Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I went to, to Nebraska, uh, starting in 1950. At that time, they had a two-year, four-year law program. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the few schools in the country that had the two-four program. You got a Bachelor of Science in... Uh, a bachelor of science degree 
uh, in the two-year uh, uh, deal, and then you went on to law school for four years. Right. And in parallel, you had uh, some students who were of the three-year program. Uh, that's right. Well, I think at Nebraska at that time, you were either uh, two and four or four and three. Mm -hmm. I think Creighton at that time uh, perhaps had a Either it had a four and three, but I think it also had a three and three program mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. I, I can't what say that for certain. You might know, but so after a year down in Nebraska, then I entered law school. Mm -hmm. What did you study as an undergraduate? Business or uh, liberal arts or something like that? Uh, somewhat of a mixture, I'd say. Dick, uh, liberal arts. Uh, but I was taking uh, physics and trigonometry and uh, wow. some of the other uh, courses. And, uh, of course, I suppose uh, in the NROTC there might have been some direction. Uh, if you're going to run a ship in the sea, they yeah. think you might want to know how to get there. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, that's right. The trigonometry and the, and the physics were required, I think, as part of that, as I remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, uh, I went four years then at uh, the law school. Well, before you get to that, uh, Judge, uh, I know you were active in the fraternity uh, as an undergraduate. Uh, uh, what drew you to the Greek uh, life? Uh, a lot of men uh, and women, of course, in those uh, days uh, were active in the Greek societies, uh, perhaps a greater percentage than are today, uh, but it's still viable. Uh, what drew you to that? Well, I had a number of friends that were members of the Phi Kappa Psi. Uh, Omaha Central seemed to have yes. quite a few in there. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and where did you go to school, Dick? Great I went uh, to, high school. I went to the old uh, Lincoln Cathedral High School. Oh, okay. And that uh, my brother went to Lincoln High School. Okay. He was older than I. You know him, uh, but uh, I went to yeah. I went to Lincoln Cathedral High School, uh, which uh, is abolished. Uh, it was taken over by uh, the Pius High School in okay. Lincoln. So. Okay. So we went different routes, and, and I, for a reason, Judge, I didn't want to go to the same high school with my big brother. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, there's how much uh, difference between uh, About two? three years. Three years? Yeah. Well, I thought the world of your brother. And where is he, if I may He's ask? In, I don't know. We ought to, ought to be interviewing you. Well, we don't but... spend too much time doing this. <laughs> but, uh, he's in New York. He's, he's uh, retired from a uh, career as a college professor, and uh, he's having the time of his life. He, uh, does a, a program for the new university, uh, Bob Carey's uh, school, oh. that is called uh, Behind the Scenes at New York's Greatest Restaurants. And oh, he takes, uh, takes a group of people every semester to all these fancy restaurants and has, you know, he, how he is. He just revels in that. Oh, yeah. Well, so let's, go back to, let's go back to your life here in, ah. the, uh, in the fraternity world, and in the world of an undergraduate and those influences that uh, shaped your life? Uh, well, uh, as I said, uh, the motivation then and the Greek system was uh, quite prevalent in, in, the, in, in those days, more so than it is today. And uh, it gave you a place away from home to live and, uh, and have social activities and to be involved with some of your friends out of the past and meet mm -hmm. new people. And so uh, it just seemed the natural thing to mm -hmm. do. Did you yeah. think when you went from the University of Omaha down to Lincoln on this NROTC scholarship yes. that you'd be going to law school? That's what I always wanted to mm -hmm. do. That was Why? Why do you suppose you wanted to do that? Were, well, I had were you a... argumentative? Were you no. <laughs> inclined to be a debater? Or? I had an uncle in Atlantic, Iowa, Boyd Cambridge, who was an attorney, and I always admired Boyd. He uh, he didn't go to law school, Dick. He he read law. You could read law sure. back then. Sure. He was uh, 
either the clerk or a deputy county clerk over there in Cass County and worked and uh, read law while he was working he, he, with a guy by the name of Swan and uh, uh, took the bar and, and passed it and he was in my estimation quite a fellow I always admired him and he just emulated what uh, I'd kind of like to be, sure. and uh, he was a very successful attorney over there. In my, in my estimation, a fine guy, and so I thought, well, that's kind of what I'd like mm -hmm. to be, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I had felt that way for a number of years. Well, you went on then. I told him once at his 80th birthday. At a party for him over there, and I told him just what I told you, and I said, "Boy, you know, I don't know whether to, to thank you or cuss you." <laughs> <laughs> How long did he keep practicing? Was he uh, was he retired think, at a normal uh, retirement age, or a lot a lot of lawyers who are in the in the practice in the smaller communities just keep going on? Yeah, I and think they carry him out feet first. I can't remember. Uh, exactly when but he did retire mm -hmm. before his death he died in in uh, 1990 and he uh, would have been i think 82 years of age at that mm -hmm. time and i think boyd retired sometime in his 70s mm -hmm. i think maybe maybe 75 or so mm -hmm. or 70. Mm -hmm. So when you went to the law college at Lincoln, you'd at least thought about the law. You had a model, uh, someone whom you had admired and were very close to, uh, who led you to the law, so to speak. Did you have any idea that law school was going to be like it was? No. <laughs> no more than uh, that I knew that the law was going to be what it was when I got out of the practice. And, Mm -hmm. and so on to the bench, but uh, uh, I, I really, I didn't, uh, I didn't work during law school in a law firm or clerk or anything like that. I, I just uh, hit the books all the time. Mm -hmm. It seemed to me hitting the books re took about all I had, and, uh, and, uh, and I, of course, had no idea what law school was either. You know, I don't know if uh, students today really know when they enter. I think maybe they have a better idea today. I and think we you're, had. I back. think you're right. Uh, we didn't have any idea at all. There was no pre-law counseling. Uh, you didn't go to visit the school. Uh, in fact, an outsider would be looked at with great suspicion when you yeah. walked into the law college. And uh, there weren't that many opportunities back then, Dick, either to uh, work in a law firm. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the the law practice back in uh, the 50s isn't what the, it wasn't like the law practice yeah. is today. There simply weren't the opportunities. If you knew somebody well and maybe had an in with somebody, you could maybe get the chance to work in a firm. But uh, and there were fellows that did work uh, during their uh, law school years in in some of the firms I know in Lincoln, and possibly they did down here at Creighton too. Mm -hmm. uh, but but you're right there. But, but it was somewhat limited. Very very limited and yeah. quite different from what it is today. Yeah. Uh, driven to a large extent by the ambition for a good job when you get out, uh, the cost of legal education today versus what it was in those days. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, I think back then, you know, I was trying to remember what the tuition was, but uh, I think somewhere in the neighborhood of five dollars a credit hour is what well, you it paid for. It certainly wasn't very much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Seventy, eighty bucks a semester would cover it. You know. What was it? What was <clears throat> what was a law law college like in those days, Judge? Uh, you still had some 
veterans around, uh, some people who'd come out of World War II and had finished up their undergraduate work and were over in the over in the law school, some Korean War veterans. So you had yeah. that age uh, thing going for you. Uh, what was the what was the classroom like uh, in terms of the intensity of uh, the Socratic method? Very intense, and uh, uh, most of the veterans. See, I would have entered law school then in '51. Mm -hmm. Most of the veterans had gone through, or uh, through the. Uh, I mean, talking about the veterans of sure. World War II. There were guys that were in after World War II mm -hmm. that maybe were coming through, but most of the actual veterans of World War II had, had um, already graduated. Uh, Nebraska at that time, I think, had a very fine faculty, mm -hmm. um, hardworking. Who was the dean? Was Fred Butel still dean? No, Fred had been dean. Uh, Fred taught constitutional law and and negotiable instruments law. He had a book, Butel's Brandon. Oh yes, I remember. I remember, his, I remember his waving at the judge in, in our class. So ten years later, gentlemen, gentlemen, this is the Bible. And of course, that was when they were having a great competition with the new uniform commercial. Yeah. Form. He said, "That's just a passing fancy." <laughs> yeah. Oh, he disliked the uniform commercial code <laughs> intensely. And uh, uh, Dean Belsheim. Edmund O. Belsheim. Edmund Belsheim was the dean. Tax man. Tax man at the time. And uh, he was the dean the entire time I was there. Mm -hmm. Dave Dow. Dave Dow, sure. Came later. Dave was uh, an excellent professor. I had him for evidence and practice lab and uh, well, he was just a fine, fine guy and a fine professor. And a, and a great role model for uh, young lawyers he as was. well. Were you in school about the time of Dick Harnsberger? Well, Dick uh, was older. He would have already graduated from law school, and he was working in a firm down there at that time. He, he hadn't joined the faculty yet mm -hmm. at Nebraska Law College. And you know, he's, of course, a fraternity brother, a fraternity brother too. too. And, uh, but Dick went with uh, college sometime after I got out of law mm -hmm. school. I can't tell you exactly when. I couldn't remember either, but he, of course, has been at the law college for a long time. Yeah. He was already a fixture by the late 1950s and has remained so uh, until this very day. Uh, that's true. And quite a guy. And quite a guy. You had him. Uh, I did have him. I did have him. Yeah. His, uh, his, it was sometimes maddening because he would ask a question and say, well, Mr. Cambridge, you have a question? And he'd ask a very complicated question. He said, hmm, that's a good question. Now well, let's go on to the next case. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guys, we had uh, Professor Lake, contracts. Now, he was probably a new, the newcomer. You know, I didn't realize at the time, and I didn't, uh, I didn't realize uh, where he had been. He clerked for on the, uh, Supreme in, Court. on the Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court. We called him the one-armed bandit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he, he remained very active in Boy Scouts uh, uh -huh. all of his life, despite that despite that and disability he had, yeah. and uh, he'd go out there and camp with the best of them, no, I didn't and know that. never, never uh, dissuaded him yeah. from doing that. So it was yeah, quite a faculty at the time. It uh, was. Memorable uh, people. Dave Dow, as I mentioned, and, uh, well, we had uh, Henry Foster teaching torts. Did you have? Did no, you, he, he, he was, was gone by the time I got there. Yeah. But he was a very remarkable guy. Yeah. And uh, Henry Grother, who later was Henry dean. Henry was later dean. Henry was a, uh, was a fine professor. And, uh, and you know, I started to tell you in connection with Lake, <coughs> I didn't know his background. 
And I didn't realize how young he and uh, Grether really were at that time. Oh. Of course, I was only, when I entered law school, I was 19. So. And you know, at 19, anybody that's uh, over 24 <laughs> like looks an like man. an old man to you, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I thought these guys are pretty old and pretty experienced, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it uh, turns out Lake couldn't have been, I think, in his 20s, uh, sometime maybe late 20s at yeah, the time. Probably. And uh, Henry Grether too. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Henry taught trusts and. Did Henry the play cards in the uh, student lounge? Oh yeah. In those days too, yeah. all his life, for nearly forty years of teaching, he's been playing, playing pitch. Yeah, playing pitch in the <laughs> in the student lounge. Henry was a fellow who was uh, very helpful to students in an informal way in getting jobs. Hmm. Uh, what kind of assistance did you have? Of course, you were had your military obligations still, but what kind of assistance did you have in thinking about a job? Well, uh, I was in the Army and uh, sent out a number of resumes, you know, uh, principally here in the Omaha area, some in Lincoln. And didn't get much in the way of any kind of responses. So I started knocking. When I got out of the Army, I started knocking on doors. and. Uh, Things were a little tight back then. I believe you know. it. I can believe it. And uh, my wife's uncle was an attorney in Lincoln and uh, uh, assistant revisor of statutes in the bill drafter. I don't. John Wilson. I don't know. Oh who, sure. You know, Jack. Jack Wilson. Sure. And he had been the uh, president of the Nebraska Bar Association the year before I got out of the army. Mm -hmm. I think it was a year, and uh, so I called on Jack, and uh, he was a great guy, uh, talking about uncles. <laughs> he was my wife's uncle, but I regard him as my uncle, and uh, uh, he had me in his office there, and he was busy. Uh, the legislature was assessing, and I think, you know, he... he uh, he was the sole person, or one of the few people, he might have had an assistant or two back then, helping him draft bills uh, well, you know, the legislature. It's, but it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because there were legendary people like that in the Capitol building. He was one of them, and George Turner George was another. Turner. He ran that Supreme Court with an iron fist and ran the State Bar Association out of his hip pocket. That's true. Mm -hmm. And he and Jack, uh, uh, he and Jack were good friends. Very and, much so. Well, anyway, Jack says, well, you know, I told him I'm looking for a job. Well, let me see what I can't do for you, he said. It. Well, I said, Jack, I don't want to take a lot of your time. No, 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 he says, that's what I'm here for. So he started making a few phone calls and told me to make some more, and he finally got back to me. And... Uh, told me about an opening in Hastings, Nebraska, with a firm and two lawyers, Al Madgett and Dick Hunter were the two lawyers on it, and that they would be willing to interview me. Uh, prior to that, I'd had an interview with uh, uh, Cassim, Squire Cassim. Oh, sure. Cassim Tierney. Cassim Tierney, Adams and Gotch, it yeah. became. It became. And uh, Squire said, well, they didn't have any openings at that time. And so I went out to an interview then and had an interview with uh, Al and Dick, Al Magic and Dick Hunter, and uh, wound up accepting uh, the offer they made me then. Now, where was your and wife from? When, when, she, when, she when did you get up, She's native born Omaha and mm -hmm. grew up here in Omaha. Mm -hmm. And uh, what did she think of the prospects of going out to, as we used to call it, rural Nebraska? It's not politically correct. We call it greater Nebraska. Greater Nebraska. What did she think of that? 
Jerry Whalen always got upset when people referred to it as outstate Nebraska. <laughs> outstate Nebraska, he says, means it's out of the state. <laughs> We're not out of the state. <laughs> well, uh, uh, she she was very receptive to it. She's told me later on that, uh, at least at the time, she indicated she was receptive to it, amenable to it. <clears throat> later on, she said, you know, that was quite a thing for me to leave Omaha. Oh, sure. <laughs> go to a smaller community. And, uh, but well, I was telling uh, Barb Gaskins on the way in that uh, she's from McCook. Oh, she is. Originally. And uh, so we were talking about the small towns. Not the small towns. Well, the small towns, too. But Hastings and McCook aren't small towns. They're good-sized cities. And, uh, and, and and what great places they were to live in and to raise your kids and uh, our, 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 if you're not on the interstate now your town's well I remember not the great, prospering very the great well great debate and, uh, when they were building the interstate and you must have been in the middle of that uh, well I got the Hastings person uh, what the practically knocked down drag out fights whether it was going to be north of the Platte or south of the Platte. Very, you're very knowledgeable. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm surprised you know that. But, uh, <laughs> that's true. Well, it had just about been, the die had been cast about the time I got to mm -hmm. Hastings. But the argument was going on. And I know my, my partner there, uh, soon, not uh, later my partner, my, the firm I was associated with, Dick Hunter was involved in that. Dick had been the county attorney out there and <clears throat> was involved in the Chamber of Commerce and all and was mm -hmm. quite active in uh, in that whole process. And Hastings lost the battle, as you know. Mm -hmm. And the uh, interstate went north of the Platte instead of south. And, uh, and it's, had, it's had its effect. Kearney and Grand Island, North Platte has grown fairly well, and yes. Hastings has been fairly static in population mm -hmm. over the years. What was it like to be in in practice when you finally got into the office there? Well, uh, you know, as I said earlier, things were a little tight back in those mm -hmm. days. I I actually took a cut in pay. I was when I got out of the army, and I, I, I think I was making uh, three and a quarter, three hundred and seventy-five dollars as a first lieutenant in the uh, army, and I went to work for about three hundred dollars a month. <laughs> they were paying the secretary more than they were me, <laughs> and she was worth she was worth, <laughs> worth more. <laughs> than I was, and uh, Professor Butel had offered me uh, a position, but I really wanted to get into the practice. I'd been in the Army two years, and and uh, I was really chomping at the bit to get mm -hmm. out into the practice. Of course, I suppose being in Hastings, it was more like the smaller town practice that your uncle had uh, uh, grown up with and uh, had been such an influence on your earlier life. Yeah, I didn't, uh, you know, I never talked to him about maybe coming back to Atlantic and practicing there. I never, I never really gave any consideration of taking the Iowa bar and going back there, and I can't uh, explain to you uh, exactly why, but uh, I guess I, by that time I'd become a Nebraskan. Yeah. And wanted to practice uh, in uh, in Nebraska, you know. And I wanted a little bigger town, I think, than Atlantic. Atlantic then had a population of seven thousand, still has a population of seven thousand. <laughs> a wonderful little town. I, I hold the fondest memories for it, and like to go back periodically. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, but I think I wanted to something a little bigger than that, and uh, so 
So, but to answer, try to answer questions more directly, back then you were drawing wills for five dollars a, a will, and oh, a simple yeah. will. That's about all people had back then was simple <laughs> wills. Uh, reading abstracts was five dollars. An abstract. Uh, Al was the uh, Magit was the city attorney at that time for the city of Hastings, so he'd give me some work there, do some research on municipal law. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I'll never forget, I remember at the time, the American Bar came out with a little pamphlet. I think it was entitled, The 1955 Lawyer and His 1935 Dollar. <laughs> and um, uh, what it encouraged local bar associations to do was to adopt a fee schedule. Mm -hmm try to, that would be a way to get together and try to increase the fees, you know, mm -hmm. uh, back in the, so a lot of communities did that. I think they did it even here in the larger cities, but they did out there, and that began to, that began to have some effect and to help, and then, of course, the sure. Supreme Court declared the I declare it to be a violation of the antitrust laws. <laughs> yeah. So people hid the fees you know. <laughs> but by that time, the economy in the country and in the state had had uh, improved, you know, and mm -hmm. things weren't as tight, and uh, money was becoming more prevalent, and there was more for attorneys. You know, I remember Judge Spencer. I took wills from Judge Spencer. Uh, at that time, he was a county judge in Lancaster mm -hmm. County. Mm -hmm. Later became, as you know, a district court judge, and, and then on the Nebraska Supreme Court. But I remember him telling us, you know, that during the 30s, if you didn't have, if a lawyer didn't have some kind of a trust that he was representing or uh, some type of going business, and there weren't many at that time. Things were really difficult. Were very tight. Were these, mm -hmm. were these uh, people who were the principals in your office, uh, you said once in a while you'd get uh, cases of, from one. Uh, were they encouraging to you, or were they passive, or uh, role models, or what was the chemistry like in the office? Oh, good chemistry. Yeah, they were encouraging, and I admired both of them very much. Uh, they'd talk with me and mm -hmm. mentor me and uh, help me, and uh, and yet gave me gave me a degree of independence to work on my own. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it was it was a. A good experience for me, probably better for me than it was for them. Cause, <laughs> you know, there came a time when you became a solo practitioner. Yeah. Uh, did, they, did those men just uh, retire or die and uh, you were the successor? No. See, I went with them in 1957, got out of the Army in September of 57, and uh, January of 64. I left the firm and entered and opened my own office. Dick, at that time, Hunter, he he decided to go with the Morrison Quirk Grain Company out there as general counsel for mm -hmm. them. Uh, Al uh, remained in practice. I went up mm -hmm. and opened my office. I felt I had to or should do it in order to in order to be in a position to increase my practice. You know, if sometimes if you're with a firm, at least back in those days, Dick, uh, you were a junior member and people had a tendency to regard you as sure. a junior member sure. of the firm. And, and so that's a little bit of a holdback, uh, mm -hmm. could be. 
And I had a banker friend there that was encouraging me to strike out on my own and uh, I could represent his bank. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the old firm Steiner and Boslow. Sure. It had been either Boslow and Steiner or Steiner and Boslow for I don't know how many years. Yes, but, sure. And uh, Les Steiner. Uh, offered uh, his partner, uh, Les Boslow, had been elected to the, to the Nebraska Supreme mm -hmm. Court to replace uh, his father. His father. The and family business. Family business. The family business. And, uh, and uh, so Les was practicing, Les Steiner was practicing on his own then. And he was a wonderful lawyer, Les was real test master and uh, all business hard fellow to get to know but once you got to know him a very warm mm -hmm. caring person well he was his wife had his wife had contracted uh, cancer and it was terminal so Les was working part-time then, and, and, and he offered to allow me to come over there and share office space with mm -hmm. him, which was very kind of him. And so I did. That's where I opened my own law office mm -hmm. there. And, and uh, then a couple of years after that, we didn't have a partnership or anything. We just shared office space. Uh, a couple of years after that, he, he indicated he was going to Retire. I tried to talk him into staying in there. I said, you and I can practice some pretty good law together, I think, Les. And, well, he said, I, he said, I just, oh, well, he said, <clears throat> I think if the law, you're either in it or you're out of it, and uh, it's not a part-time job, it's a, full-time job and you got to stay on top of it and you got to keep up and it's difficult to do if you aren't in it full-time. I said, ah, I said, Les, you're good enough that you could write on just what you got right now for quite a while. <laughs> he said, well, you know, he said, I'm up here in Nebraska and uh, headaches, my stomach's upset, I'm not feeling good. But he said, you know, I go down to Florida and I lay on the beach and how wonderful, <laughs> how wonderful I feel, he said. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I continued to practice solo practice then. It was really a general uh, practice too, wasn't it? It was a general practice and, uh, of course you had the bank as you explained, but uh, you had a reputation for having a broad-based, old-fashioned general practice of law. Yeah. We used to have those, and some lawyers still do, mm -hmm. you know, especially in your, in your uh, smaller communities uh, and even in the larger communities, some of them. Are. And, uh, but I was fortunate. I, I got to represent the Hastings School District out mm -hmm. there for a number of years, and uh, they were one of my clients. One of the first things I did was, uh, when I went to Hastings, was uh, I was retained to represent the Glenwood Telephone Corporation, and the, they bought up a little, I was involved in that. They, at that time, they had the old Magneto dial system where sure. you had eight parties on a line, you know, <clears throat> less than most of the time. <laughs> and uh, we got an REA loan and bought up the little phone companies around there to the southwest quadrant of Hastings. And, oh, uh, and so I represented them. They were a good client. And, uh, oh, represented uh, Home Federal Savings and Loan Association out there. 
That generated uh, a lot of abstracts to be read. I believe it. And uh, uh, who else? Were you uh, active? Were you active at all politically? No, not really. Anyway, were you uh, knowledgeable, uh, known to uh, political people? Uh, any? Oh, not really. I, uh, you know, I'd always been a at least regarded myself as a Republican and, uh, or let's say conservative in philosophy as opposed to mm -hmm. a liberal philosophy. And, uh, but I never was active in uh, politics at either the county or state level, really. And uh, well, I'll tell you, Dick, I, at least for me, uh, I just devoted myself to the practice principally. Uh, when you're a sole practitioner, you, you don't have much time for uh, hobbies, so to speak. Hobbies or politics or uh, extracurricular activities of any type. You're working, <clears throat> at least I was, all day long and most nights and most weekends too. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, well, I asked yeah, you, yeah. ask you that, Judge, because when the vacancy occurred on the Nebraska District Court and you submitted your name uh, under the merit plan, uh, which we have in this state, uh, what went through your mind then about uh, the possibility of your getting the job or how this was going to transform your life? Well, uh, you know, if you had told me back then that maybe I'd be a judge, I, 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 uh, <laughs> I would have told you, no way. Uh, judge Irons, Fred Irons, he'd been one of the, he was an attorney with old Jim Conway. Conway and Irons was the old firm out right. there. And uh, he announced his retirement. And I didn't give it any thought, but uh, a young attorney out there said, well, why don't you, why don't you maybe apply for it? And uh, I said, just what I told you, oh, no way would I be interested in that. That was in 1981, when I was 50 years old. I have two daughters, and uh, they had both I graduated from college, and uh, I got to thinking about it. I thought, well, maybe I ought to give it some consideration. And uh, but then I looked up what the pay was in the Nebraska statutes for a district judge at that time. And again said, oh, no, no way. <laughs> <laughs> it was about a third of what I was sure. making in uh, the practice at that time. But I thought more and more about it, and with the kids being grown and all, mm. you know, mm. when you're in the heat of practice, You're driving all of, at all times toward a given end. Uh, you don't really have the time, Dick, sometimes uh, to devote your attention and your your curiosity towards those some of those issues that really really make you uh, interested in the law because you have to. You have to deliver on the case you got, or you have to on whatever you're working on. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't spend time on things that uh, that don't have to be done and uh, aren't making any money. Sure, sure. you know. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So I got to thinking, by gosh, wouldn't that be nice to be able to devote some time to research and to 
working on things that have uh, always been of interest to you, but not, you just haven't been able to work on. And so, I finally decided, well, maybe I should. What was the competition like? Well, uh, I'm thinking back now, uh, the big competition was John Dyer out of Holdridge. Sure. Uh, Judge Norris Chatterton was from Holdridge. The 10th Judicial District at that time had seven counties in it, and uh, judges had principally been from Red Cloud up to that point and Hastings. Judge Chatterton from Holdridge on the western part of the district served as a judge, and, and I think the fellows out there in Holdridge, uh, Phelps County, and then he retired. Judge Sprague out of Red Cloud was uh -huh. appointed as his successor, Barney. And I think that the fellows in Holdridge felt that the district ought to be that way, judge from the western part of the state. and. A judge from the you know, from the western part of the district and a judge from the eastern part, and because uh, what we do, the practice had been to rotate. You we divide it into four and three county sub districts, so to speak. The judges would, and then they would take turns. Sure. Uh, every six months we'd switch. You'd serve the three eastern counties when you're in Hastings, and then four western counties when you were out there. And so I think they felt uh, that there should be a judge out there. And so at the time, uh, there was a bit of a push to get John Dyer appointed as the judge. And uh, so I'd say that was the main competition. And it was... Uh, and, uh, but it worked out. You were both advanced uh, to the governor, Governor Charlie Thone, at the time. Did he have a meeting with you? Or yeah, you he by interviewed, and uh, forgive me, I can't, um, for, and I ask the forgiveness of the other gentleman, too, that was nominated. There were three of us that were nominated and interviewed by um, Governor Thone. And, uh, and uh, but I I'd asked you earlier about the political connections and the nature of your practice uh, was such that you're concentrating on the law and you weren't a hail fellow, well-met, uh, political backslapping type of guy. Uh, so this probably wasn't an in, in, intimate uh, kind <coughs> of chums getting together and winking at one another about who's going to get this job. Uh, this I, don't, I don't think so, although I'm sure there was some... Uh, I'm sure there was some maneuvering with respect to the issue of whether or not the judge should come from Hastings sure. or come from sure. uh, the western part of the district. But I wasn't privy to that, <laughs> Dick. Well, you know, you a lot of things go on in connection with the appointment of judges that the, the nominee is not privy to. And a lot of things that go on that don't have a thing to do with the oh yes the merits of the they only call the nominee. It a, they only call it a merit plan. <laughs> well, I'm not talking so much. Uh, I, I I think the merit plan's a fine thing. I this. do too. I do too. In fact, when I went on the when I went on the state bench. I took advantage of the opportunity to go to the, Nebraska, to the uh, National Judicial College, which uh, was and is at uh, Reno, Nevada. Uh, every, I assume it's still the case uh, when you become a state judge here in Nebraska that you have the opportunity to go out there, and you go out there for a three or four week period and have a, a review of a number of subjects. It's an excellent, excellent school college. I uh, always wondered what in the world it was doing at Reno, Nevada, but it was uh, 
run under the auspices at that time of the, of the American Bar Association, uh, Seagram's offered to give them a couple million dollars out there to start the thing. And trustees had a b bit of a difficult time deciding whether or not they could take uh, money for the college from a business that makes gin, you know. <laughs> but they finally decided it was acceptable. And uh, so that was the start of the National Judicial College. I'm sorry I digress. Not at all. Not at all. It's, it's delightful. But, uh, uh, and I'm, forgive me, I've lost my train of thought here. Uh, you had that tra training at uh, Reno. Yeah. Uh, kind of helped you get a perspective, at least, on uh, the job of judging as yeah. opposed to the practice of law. Yeah, but that really wasn't where I was going, Dick. I'm sorry. Oh, well, that's all right. But uh, maybe it'll come back to me. Well, that's great. Uh, you served then as a state judge uh, for a period of about seven years or so. You're and a very knowledgeable fellow. Well, You've been doing some work. I was doing my homework. Uh, and then you uh, get an opportunity uh, to have your name submitted for the United States federal judgeship yeah. in the District of Nebraska. How did that come about? Well, uh, that uh, vacancy occurred, and uh, I got to thinking, well, maybe I'd maybe I'd like to serve as a federal judge. Talk to a few people, and uh, uh, I had and have at this time a very good friend, Dwayne Ackley. Sure. who has been very instrumental in political matters here in the state of Nebraska. Served as Republican National Committee man for a long time, and, and other than that is a man of a great moment in the practice of law, our profession, the practice right. of law in the state. And a very successful businessman. Mm -hmm. uh, so I talked to Duane and uh, Said, well, maybe we, maybe we, could, maybe we could, should go for it. So, and uh, so we did. And uh, that's basically. Uh, again, I had no no real activity in politics. But once in a while, on these, on these, I uh, had a friend that was and did, uh, <laughs> and still did. and a very important one. Uh, once in a while in these judicial appointments, uh, uh, putting aside the merit of the man, uh, there may be reasons like you'd explain in your judicial district for the state uh, judgeship, uh, reasons that uh, uh, are pulling at an appointment out state or an Omaha appointment or uh, this is uh, Senator so-and-so's chance, and that was Senator so-and-so's chance previously, and so were, were there any of that that you were aware of at all in your... Oh, yeah. Uh, and when I say there are forces at work that don't have anything to do with the merit, I don't mean to, uh, in so stating, denigrate the merits of anybody oh, involved. Oh, the country. No. Uh, it's just that I reckon it to uh, being an, uh, in an airplane in a hurricane. Uh, <laughs> There are all kinds of forces and shears at work that uh, that really don't have much to do with the merits of the of the individuals sure. involved. And uh, well, uh, at the time, there was talk that uh, the appointment should come from the third district. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, at that time, Judge Strom was here. Sure. Was the only judge, federal judge, United States District Judge, active judge here in Omaha, and Urbaum was in Lincoln. Strom was from Omaha, Urbaum was from Lincoln, and so 
the push was there ought to be somebody representing the third district, uh, rural Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Dave Carnes was senator at that time. He deferred to uh, Virginia Smith. Virginia Smith. Uh, she first nominated a, a gentleman from Aurora, uh, the ABA. Didn't look upon that nomination favorably, and, and I at that time had given up on the oh, sure. probably the possibility of receiving the appointment. But I was out minning one day, holding court, and got a call from I can't remember the gentleman's name now, asking if I was still interested in the, the appointment to the federal bench, and I said sure. And. Uh, so that, uh, that nomination was made, and there was also a contingent uh, uh, here in Omaha that didn't look favorably on a third district appointment, I think. And, <laughs> and, uh, and there was quite a push at that time to, uh, to have uh, Richard Cuff, who was then a magistrate mm -hmm. judge. Uh, receive the appointment, and Judge Cuff is the finest judge as you'll ever meet, and a wonderful fellow. And uh, but Third District uh, prevailed on the matter, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, Rich by then was down here in Omaha, and uh, the argument was, well, he's still from Lexington, still Third uh -huh. District. But I guess the fact that he was down here and maybe the fact that I was out there mm -hmm. had some uh, weight and and I received the appointment. Was Luckily, a, unfortunately. It was, a, it was a wonderful experience for the lawyers in the Judicial District of Nebraska to have you as a judge uh, serving them and serving uh, the law for lo those many years that you sat on the bench. Uh, yeah. Your, your reputation precedes you as a man of grace and uh, knowledge, yeah. intellect, and wisdom. I, I I thank you for all that, Dick. I'm sure there'd be a few that would agree with you, and I'm sure there'd be a few, <laughs> few that uh, would disagree with you, too. Uh, but I tell you, I've been really very privileged. Uh, I've been a very fortunate, lucky fellow because... I had the opportunity to practice law for 24 years, and uh, it was a good practice. Uh, uh, I made a good living. I didn't make a million bucks. Uh, uh, wasn't as lucrative as some practices are now, but uh, I had the opportunity to serve people and help people. And uh, I enjoyed it. And then the opportunity to serve on the district bench, uh, state district bench. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do that was I think it's important. I think it's important that the law be right at the lowest level possible, you know. People, sure. people don't have that much contact with the appellate courts. And they have more contact with the right. The lower courts and the lower the court, right down to the municipal or county or juvenile level, That's they right. have more contact uh, there. Judges and so it's important, it was important to me, it seemed, that those those decisions be right and correct yeah. and and that the public uh, the public gets the best shot they can at getting justice. Now, I guess I thought I had the ability to do that, and uh, uh, so I ran for the job. I, I, I and well, forgive me. Uh, I don't mean to sound 
immodest, and I don't mean Not to sound all, that I got a claim on that. I Not don't, at all. but you, I you, felt I could make some you do small have contribution a, to it. You do have a perspective on it that I agree with you is right and appropriate. Judge, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I can't believe it. Can't believe it. Uh, it's been a pleasure to visit with Judge William Cambridge, a retired judge of the United States District Court for the District of Nebraska. Uh, this program has been brought to you by the Historical Society of the United States District Courts, and it's been under the production of B Professor Barbara Gaskins. I'm Richard Chagru at the Creighton University School of Law. <laughs>